Okay, everyone, welcome to your community. We call this citizen driven research, kindness, gratitude, and an extended family. And we put all those things together, and that is our call to battle against ALS, us and you together. So welcome, and Chris, Kristen, welcome to you. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, evidently, since I'm recording, I cannot put my... Um, let me share my screen. I can't put it on minimize, which I was trying to do earlier. Um, I would like to remind you that if you would love to sign up for our Radcliffe study that we are still enrolling, um, we have, as of today, 99 participants and our goal is 100. Um, this isn't just a study where we get data and we keep it. Um, data goes right back to you and you can look at it in your portal. You can share it with it, your caregivers. Um, it's It doesn't just stay in a place. So if you're interested in enrolling, this will absolutely be going in the chat. And we would love to have you. So thank you. And with that being said, I'm going to give it right to Casey, who's going to introduce our speakers for tonight. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's expert talk series. We have two speakers tonight. Our first one is Dr. John Hansen Flashin. He is the Paul F. Heron Jr. Family Emeritus Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He served from 1990 through 2014 as the Chief of the Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Division at Penn. And as Division Chief, Dr. Hansen Flashin founded the multidisciplinary Paul Heron Lung Center at Penn. In 2017, he founded the J. and Randy Fishman Program from Home Assisted Ventilation within the Heron Lung Center. This endowed program serves adults who require long-term mechanically assisted ventilation for chronic hypoventilation. Application of the latest technology for respiratory support enables people who are disabled by chronic nerve or muscle diseases such as ALS to live at home and engage in their communities. And our second speaker is Kathleen Sheehan. Kathleen Sheehan has served as Vice President of the Public Policy for the ALS Association since December of 2016. In this role, Kathleen and her team are responsible for advocating with Congress and policymakers to provide more funding for ALS research across several federal agencies, including anything. the Department of Defense ALS Research Program, the NIH, and the National ALS Registry and Biorespiratory at CDC. She also advocates for Congress to pass laws to improve the quality of life for people living with ALS and their families. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Hansen Flashin and Kathleen Sheehan. I should be unmuted now, and let's see if you can see my screen. There, uh, we are. We are bored. Everything okay? Yes. Everything good. Great. Two thousand fifteen, I think it was. I saw my first ever ALS outpatient. Confess, I didn't know much about the disease. Two thousand seventeen, when I was supposed to be retiring, I founded the J. and Randy Fishman Program for Home Assisted Ventilation, University of Pennsylvania, with the benefit of an extraordinary gift from the Fishmans and from their many friends worldwide. Uh, and uh, this has become a, uh, a major focus of my failed retirement, a uh, source of great gratification for me. Uh, I'm going to describe today the single source of greatest frustration I have, along with other people who are in this field. Eric, uh, a minute ago, said his job is to make everybody happy. Well, my job tonight is to make you mad. I want to make you mad, as mad as, uh, as I am and Kathleen are. Uh, here's the problem. Because of outdated or ill-conceived coverage criteria, Medicare routinely delays or denies coverage for home non-invasive ventilation. 
spike considerable effort by the pulmonary professional community over several years now, no correction is currently in sight. Well, that's a strong statement, and this is an era where everybody's overstating everything. And I, I want to convince you that uh, I said it right. Uh, 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 this is a major problem, and it's correctable uh, with appropriate pressure and focus and drive uh, directed at Medicare to, to, to clean this up. Uh, the uh, uh, problem here is... Uh, experienced by patients, but also by clinicians, uh, so much so that it's a reason that people, pulmonologists, don't like to go into this emerging field of chronic respiratory failure because uh, so much effort and aggravation is required to get people the equipment and the, and the service they need. In, in order to, to get a picture of uh, the problem, I want to remind you that there are two different kinds of devices that are used to assist ventilation in chronic respiratory failure. Uh, I'm gonna get a little technical in this talk, uh, and some of it is confusing because some of the terminology uh, has multiple meanings. You gotta have to know the context to understand what someone's talking about. There's areas of confusion even for clinicians. But bear with me, and if you don't get all the technical details, please at least um, well, come away from this with an understanding of the, the scope and magnitude and the impact of the, of the problem that we're facing. So the first type of device uh, Medicare calls respiratory assist devices, RADS, R-A-D-S, otherwise commonly called bilevel devices. These evolved out of CPAP machines um, here are two machines uh, commonly in use today, a Philips Stream Station and a ResMed Air Curve uh, for the purpose of supporting people with neuromuscular disease with ALS, uh, the higher level, more advanced models are necessary and appropriate. And uh, there are many models, but uh, uh, the highest level machines are appropriate for the purpose uh, that we're talking about tonight. These are tabletop machines, small, easily carried, or easily lifted, and they're designed to assist breathing during sleep. Uh, you'll see here the simple controls uh, for simple settings, and here's a, a place to put water to humidified air and tubing to a guy wearing a mask. These are nighttime machines for people who can survive without the benefit of a ventilator. <clears throat> In ALS, early on, nighttime non-invasive ventilation is used to improve the quality of sleep, to rest breathing muscles overnight, to give them a more strength and endurance during the day. The other higher level device in use today has various names, but let's call them portable ventilators. These are home life support machines. And I've shown uh, six uh, the machines currently approved for use in the United States. And if you have ALS or know someone, you might recognize one or more of these machines. They're a little bit bigger than bi-level devices. Uh, very importantly, they have large screens on them that make it uh, much easier and, and more foolproof to set the complicated settings that are often appropriate for these machines. Uh, they have internal batteries to back them up if there's a power failure, life support machine, and to power them uh, for portable use uh, as people extend beyond nighttime ventilation on into daytime support as well. There's an important difference in how Medicare reimburses these. The first bi-level devices are rent to buy. So the uh, you as a consumer rent this for 13 months and after that you own it, it's yours. Uh, this strategy means that the home durable medical equipment company comes and uh, sets it up in your home. And once it's set up, um, 
they pretty much fulfill their obligation to you and, and they'll sell you supplies after that. But, but uh, that contrast with home life support devices that are rented continuously for as long as there's a need. And the rental payment is intended to cover continuous support and uh, repair and replacement with a 24 hour coverage uh, for problems that arise and uh, home respiratory therapists coming to your house periodically to check, update the equipment and the supplies of the settings. Um, you're, so you're, this is the only way that respiratory therapy can be reimbursed in the United States today. And it's respiratory therapy in the home is tacked on to the rental for these machines. For that reason, they're quite a bit more expensive uh, for uh, an uh, insurance company. Uh, and uh, we'll look, hear more about that sh shortly. These devices designed for life support on into the day as well as the night, expanded settings, full alarm options, and again, that large screen that makes it uh, possible for us to adjust and titrate and, and monitor uh, complex settings. Here in the picture is one of my patients, photo used with her permission, uh, cruising along in a bicycle with her ventilator attached to the back uh, by virtue of having a home ventilator, uh, she's able to get out of bed and out and about now in her community. Medicare coverage criteria for the lo lower level devices, the bi-level devices, hasn't changed in a number of years. It is way out of date. There's been uh, something like 20 years of research since that time, and uh, and, and no change in these in these uh, criteria. Uh, one of the three following is necessary, and I want to belabor it, but the most important of these criteria is a forced vital capacity. Breathe into a machine, measure how strong your exhalation is, less than 50% predicted. Well, now we know that respiratory failure is quite advanced at 50% predicted. That's well far along in the disease. A wealth of data and information demonstrates that people have better quality of life and now a strong suspicion of longer survival if bi-level ventilation or, or home ventilation is started well before the vital capacity reaches 50%. So much so that a group of American pulmonologists and sleep physicians representing all four of the organizations, professional organizations relevant to home ventilation uh, got together and put forward a consensus statement, an optimal NIV Medicare access promotion. Uh, they did this for other diseases as well, but thoracic restrictive disorders is the category that uh, ALS falls into along with congenital neuromuscular diseases. This was published in 2021 and was intended primarily to provide guidance to Medicare and other insurers uh, of what evidence-based um, strategies and criteria should be in this current era. Now here in the table, you, you see the indications that were recommended by this group, and you don't have to wade through all of them, but very, very importantly to summarize to the right is a vital capacity of less than 80% predicted, not 50 in the current criteria, but 80% predicted, that's the threshold of abnormal in together with one or more respiratory symptoms. That could be shortness of breath on exertion, um, discomfort lying flat in a bed, a morning headache, a daytime sleepiness, or unrefreshing uh, sleep. Less than 80%, any of those criteria uh, now is the current standard of practice in the United States and Europe. Europe has a similar consensus statement. Um, and uh, the hope was in 2021, the Medicare would adopt these and, and make new rules, but they did not do it. So 50% predicted. Um, it's still the rule, and that's too late uh, for many people. Uh, there's tricks to get around this, uh, tricks that are known to 
uh, clinicians who have a special interest in home ventilation, it's a small but rapidly growing group of uh, pulmonologists and sleep physicians who are taking this on as an area of special interest in their practice. But there are many other prescribers, uh, hospital prescribers and uh, neurologists and uh, pulmonologists unrelated to this uh, who ha have no knowledge or awareness of these clever little find the, the gap in the rule uh, wraparounds. And, and so people uh, get onto ventilators later than they should. <clears throat> Different criteria for, for ventilators. Prior to 2016, Medicare delegated the judgment, the decision of when to use a home ventilator instead of a bi-level device to the prescribing position. Then understand this is a life support machine uh, and is appropriate for more severe disease for people who need home, uh, home ventilation uh, longer than at nighttime on into where it's a true life support machine that is somebody would die without the benefit of a home ventilator. So problem was difficult criteria to get into bi-level devices, much more flexible criteria for the more expensive home ventilators. There was a dramatic increase in the number of prescriptions for home ventilators relative to bi-level devices driven particularly in the care of patients with COPD. Medicare clamped down on that in a series of revisions to the rules. And um, since about 2020, uh, there's a statement that uh, the guides uh, coverage criteria for portable ventilators, and here's the essence of it. Home ventilators are not covered for continuous or intermittent positive airway pressure by level PAP, regardless of the illness treated by the device. Here's where terminology gets confusing. You see that BiPAP is a uh, proprietary name of, of uh, Philips Respironics. It's like Kleenex. Uh, we use the term bi-level instead of BiPAP. So there's bi-level machines, but in fact, all the devices we use for home ventilation in current practice use bi-level positive airway pressure. That's the name of the protocol that the machine uses to support breathing. So what this says, taken literally, is that home ventilators are not um, covered for bi-level PAP, the main technique that we use for all ventilation right up to 24 hours a day, regardless of the disease. So it, it, it it's it's a, just a flat out error. And this is just written by people who didn't understand the difference in the meaning of bi-level or BiPAP according to the uh, uh, context, the term is being used and it just makes an impossible situation. So what uh, uh, private insurers uh, in their own coverage and uh, uh, in uh, Medicare Advantage often uh, interpret that in a very conservative way, in a way to minimize their uh, ex exposure to the more expensive home ventilators. So what they say is, uh, maybe what they meant was um, not, not covered if a BiPAP, a bi-level machine could serve the purpose. So, not covered if the prescribed settings can be supplied by a bi-level device. Uh, there's big differences between these machines, but the most advanced bi-level devices do in fact allow most of the settings that are typically used in home ventilation regardless of the machine. So home durable medical equipment companies trying to stay out of trouble with Medicare and trying to get approval from insurance companies insist that we use um, settings, prescribed settings that are not available on the other machines. There's just a couple of those settings altogether and maybe they're appropriate to the situation, maybe not. But we've learned kind of the scam. I'm being very frank here. This is a public and recording. Um, that we've kind of scanned the system by using uh, these exception settings 
in order to get home durable medical equipment companies to supply the machines and insurance coverage to pay them, miss completely missing the appropriate and reasonable differences between these two machines. Another interpretation that's very common is that somebody has to fail a bi-level device before they advance to a home ventilator. Now, now that happens commonly when somebody starts on a, on a bi-level device and their disease advances for any of several reasons, they come to a point where they're more appropriately um, served with a home ventilator and, and we switch them over. But some people start late, even later than a vital capacity of 50% predicted, somewhat urgently. In a hospital, for example, after they crashed in with respiratory failure or in an office when they're getting close to it. And some people uh, with, uh, with uh, OBAR onset disease uh, need, need uh, the, the precise adjustments and the feedback that the higher level machines use. So. Uh, there are situations where somebody's coming off a, a ventilator in a hospital and they're supposed to go through this lower level bi-level device and fail it somehow or another before they get to a machine. Uh, this also doesn't make any sense for special situations for that are very, very common. So this, what do you do here? You fight them and say an appeal and appeal again or have deliver a bi-level machine and use it for three hours and then say that the patient failed it. Uh, uh, these are interpretations of people that apply Medicare through Medicare Advantage and through uh, traditional Medicare of that crazy confusing rule that we just saw. And it, uh, we pointed it out to them a number of times. It's not an interest in changing or adjusting it. It makes us kind of feel like, well, these are vulnerable people who don't speak very much, and we can get away with cutting our expenses a little bit by having these, these, uh, these rules. The other big problem with home ventilators is, is coverage for two devices. Now, the current Medicare coverage criteria allow for two devices under special circumstances, and the one that's most relevant to ALS is in here. The patient is confined to a wheelchair during the day that requires a ventilator mounted to the chair and they need a second ventilator of the same type for use in bed. So uh, we want people up and out of bed like the picture I showed or out, out, and, and sitting in downstairs at least uh, and moving around their house if not actually in a power chair and cruising about. Uh, uh, I'm getting technical here, but there are people who are very well served by mouthpiece ventilation while sitting in a power chair. The tubing, the setup, the settings for this type of day ventilation are quite substantially different from the night settings. So there's a period of time when there's a stop, hook onto different tubing uh, and, and different masks, and switch over to the different settings. That takes time. People feeling shortness of breath during that time, taking the machine off the off the table, disconnecting the nebulizer, attaching it somehow onto the back of the wheelchair. Uh, and it's a time when it's possible to make fatal mistakes, dangerous and fatal mistakes in that transition. So it's just not prudent care to try and make this work with one ventilator. And Medicare recognizes that. And, 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 and has this right in their rules. However, some major insurance companies, and I'll name two of them, uh, United Healthcare and Aetna categorically deny coverage for a second ventilator. They don't care, they don't wanna hear the story. Uh, they consider that an indulgence, a, a, um, a lifestyle thing rather than uh, appropriate part of life support. Uh, we, we've, just to pu push the point, we've appealed these hard and heavy several times and a couple times finally broken through and other times not. So this is the other big problem with coverage of portable ventilators. Uh, you know, Medicare will cover a, a lot of expense for a 
artificial limb after an amputation so that somebody can get up and out of bed and get around in a bud. Under certain circumstances, you need a ventilator, you need a second ventilator to get out and about with ALS. Not recognizing the similarities between those two just seems discriminatory to me. We think people should have as much life and as much independence and much engagement as possible with the otherwise horrible disease. And uh, to make that uh, straightforward requires pressure on CMS, pressure on Medicare to update their rules and uh, some policing of some of the private insurers that support Medicare patients um, by even being more, uh, more restrictive than the current Medicare rules or interpreting them in the most conservative possible way. So I hope I made you mad. And uh, Kathleen's job is, is the second half of our title, what can be done about it? So please, uh, please pick up your ears and, and uh, think about getting engaged. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks, John. A great presentation. And I would say that he's really been one of the leaders uh, working with us in this effort and, and very passionate. And uh, he participated with me in phone call with CMS and, and done a good job of educating us about um, about what, what we're up against. Um, why don't we go ahead and start my slides. So I just want to tell everybody, these slides will be sent to you. Um, so I don't want anyone to be worried about any of the details that I'm sharing. Uh, you will get this information. And uh, there are going to be uh, two action items that you can take. I'm going to also give an update on the Act for ALS uh, and an action item for that at the, at the end of my presentation. So um, next slide, please. I think that um, uh, uh, I saw a note from Chris in the chat, and I think um, this is really important. I'm going to spend a few minutes on it. It really does matter what kind of insurance you have. It also matters where you live. So uh, people that have original Medicare do not have as many problems getting the NIV. I know physicians are frustrated sometimes with the original Medicare, but largely the problems lie with Medicare Part C. Uh, and I would say that um, anyone who's turned on their television has seen the heavy marketing uh, on Medicare Advantage. Um, and this has been a concern of the administration. Um, and I think it's really important that people uh, be very thoughtful. Some people get on Medicare Advantage before they know uh, they have ALS and other people choose it. I had a physician tell me I chose Medicare uh, Advantage because it looked like my insurance, my I work plan what I had at work. So I thought it was a, was a good deal. There are some good Medicare Advantage companies. I don't want to um, um, put down them as a class, but there are some problem ones. Uh, next slide, please. I always like to remind people that uh, Medicare's annual enrollment period is still open. Uh, it ends on December 7th. And um, as I mentioned a moment ago, because of the heavy marketing on television, I think it's extremely important for people to have um, federally funded and objective advice regarding insurance. And people may not know this, but state insurance uh, assistance programs are there to help you. Uh, you can go to the website, uh, you can get on the phone and call them. So I would really encourage folks, if you have any thoughts about what you might want to do in terms of uh, enrollment, or if you know somebody who's going on to Medicare, to um, get them to contact um, their uh, ship and, and get some good advice, rather than listen to the TV and the, the pitches for free groceries and transportation. Uh, next slide, please. I think, um, uh, uh, Dr. John Hansen uh, described this very well. Physicians prescribe. They spend a lot of time with patients. They do a lot of testing. 
uh, and they know what they're doing. They prescribe an NIV, a life support device, because it improves the quality and length of life. Um, prior authorization is the main problem. MA plans are allowed to use prior authorization and utilization re uh, requirements uh, to control costs because they receive a flat fee. Uh, and many MA plans, or some MA plans, I should say, question medical necessity. And they may use uh, excessive prior authorization requirements. And as we just heard a few moments ago, the fail first, uh, which is just a horrible thought. Um, pressure point, physicians and their staff spend endless hours providing justifications and doing appeals to MA plan. I would say that frustrations run very high. Uh, and John just explained to us, um, you know, what, physicians are trying to accomplish and how hard it must be to come up against uh, some of these MA plans who are just um, uh, don't care um, uh, about getting the right uh, piece of equipment. Um, and what happens to the patient um, while a patient is waiting for a long period of time for prior authorization or gets, gets an inappropriate machine, their respiratory status continues to deteriorate and some physicians do resort to hospitalization or use some of the other techniques that, that John described a moment ago because they have no other choice but to do that in terms of getting um, someone an NIV. Next slide, please. So what needs to be done? Okay, CMS uh, has the ability to change their policies and make a difference. Uh, we have been lobbying them. I think John explained the respiratory physicians, the pulmonologists have been lobbying them to take action. They have not taken action. There are many things that could be done to improve respiratory uh, policies and procedures at Medicare. They're out of date uh, and they need to be updated. Right now, we're trying to fix this one thing because it seems to be having the biggest impact on people living with ALS. So we've met with CMS. Uh, we told them why they need to change their policies and require MA plans to provide immediate access to NIV when physicians prescribe. So that is our current goal is to get CMS to do the right thing. What else should we be doing? We must convince Congress to change how MA plans care for vulnerable patients, including people living with ALS. Prior authorization should not harm access. I do a lot of work also on ALS drugs, talking to physicians, as we've talked about this for NIV. Of course, physicians say to us, I really have a very difficult time uh, with getting uh, medications, NIV, those kinds of things. Uh, and so we really need to fix overall how Medicare Advantage works uh, and the prior authorization process. Uh, for people who, who are vulnerable and who need really immediate access to the kind of equipment um, that, that um, we all know is needed. So who's working with us on this? So we've been working predominantly with ALS physicians so far uh, because they are best situated to describe what the problem is and to help us figure out what the solution is needed. We've also talked to quite a few people living with ALS um, the, our, the ALS Association is working on it. John mentioned also the American Academy of Chest Physicians, um, AA Home Care, which is the national association which, which represents uh, durable medical equipment providers, other ALS organizations, and other stakeholders. So that's who our partners are uh, in this effort. And there's um, uh, Tommy, who's our board member, using his NIV. Uh, he's had a long and successful uh, life uh, with, with the support of that equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So what are, we, what are the challenges? Well, it's very hard to collect the data, and that is because the durable medical equipment providers are not set up to collect this data. Um, and they have to basically dig into their records and look at individual case studies to figure out when, uh, how long was the delay, uh, was a substitution made and the denial. So it's been very hard to get the data. Uh, I would say this also um, providers and physicians both deal with many different insurance plans. 
uh, and um, United Healthcare, which is one of the plans that we're concerned about, may have a Medicare fee for service. They may have a Medicare Advantage. They may have a, a, a employer insurance plan. All of the different plans have different rules and regulations. And so um, durable medical equipment providers and physicians are sometimes reluctant to point the finger at one particular company. And it is true that we need to change the policies for everyone because there may be um, an organization that's doing this now, could be somebody else will do in the future. So we really want to change the policies and procedures. Um, we've got to fix Medicare policies that have loopholes for MA plans and little oversight and don't do a good job of um, the policies and procedures for respiratory care. Um, there's a complex insurance system that we have, uh, and that's why I showed you that slide. Each of the plans operates differently. And, and as I mentioned, the MA plans are doing a lot of TV marketing, which I think uh, really is it's inappropriate in terms of helping people to choose the right kind of insurance. Physicians are fighting hard, but frustrated by long ex excessive prior authorization. They want to be providing patient care. They don't want to be dealing with prior authorization claims. And what happens to the people living with ALS and their families, um, they're suffering um, when inadequate equipment is provided. And the, perhaps the hardest part is the physicians struggle with all of the appeals for prior authorization and when they get to the end of the road and there's a denial, uh, it's up to the patient to make that appeal. That's the way Medicare Advantage plans are structured. Only the patient can make the appeal. This doesn't work for many patients because if you need a non-invasive ventilator, you're having great difficulty breathing, you're probably very sick, and going through the paperwork on your own and making the appeal an interior appeal, an exterior appeal, then it gets bumped up to the next level. And honestly, everything ALS could do a whole session on how to do the appeal process um, because you can make the appeal, but it just takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, we've written letters to Medicare. We met with them on the phone. Uh, and Medicare's response to us is, where is the data showing that this is not a problem? It's not being reported through the Medicare appeal process for all the reasons that I just described. By the time they get to the denial phase, um, uh, patients are like, I've, I've had it. I've done everything I can. My physician's done everything I can. I don't want to spend the rest of my life dealing with the paperwork for uh, the appeal process. So um, these high level officials are saying, we're not seeing this problem. So um, we don't think anything needs to be fixed. Yes, Medicare Advantage plans are allowed to control costs using these measures, and but we're not seeing any harm to patients yet. That's, that's what they're telling us. Next slide, please. So what can you do right now? So we're at a certain stage of this process. What we need, and we met with CMS, they said, we need the stories, we need the data, we want the details, what is happening, what companies are doing this, what, what, what are the dangers to patients, um, what's going on. So we really need those stories. Um, so, And we want people to focus on Medicare Advantage for this particular uh, effort. So we have set up a basically um, a, a, an action alert that will allow you to tell your story and help us to collect these stories. So you can use the, the QR code, you can use the information on the slide, um, but the, the easiest thing to do is just to go to als.org and click advocacy and go to the action center and you'll see a ton of opportunities to take this. Um, tell your story is at the, at the end of the list. Um, next slide, please. I want to give another uh, action alert for you all and give you an update on the ALS Better Care Act. So uh, the bill is in the House and Senate introduced, uh, and it's going to improve your access to multidisciplinary care, uh, reduce wait times to see health care by um, providing additional funds to the clinics, 
um, so that people living with ALS can access current treatments and clinical trials. And everyone knows that early intervention is critically important. So at the same place that you can find the other uh, tell your story, you will find uh, this um, action alert that you can go to. So at the bottom of the screen, again, go to ALS.org and click advocacy, or if you can uh, do these QR codes, you're welcome to. Um, I think that might be the end of the slide. Maybe one more slide, let's see. That would be the end. Okay, that was the end. Can you go back one slide, please, then to, um, to the action, actually go back one more. Well, no, stay here, this is good. Um, what I wanted to tell folks is that we have recently begun reaching out to Congress. And, and here is why this happens. When you go to Congress, what they say is, have you talked to CMS? Have you done a full faith effort to CMS? Have you told them what they're do doing wrong? Have you told them how to fix it? That is the first question that Congress asks. So we've been doing that. Um, and so now we're doing, we've talked to some people with the ALS caucus and asked them if they will send a letter to CMS and put pressure on the CMS to do something about this. That is one step uh, in the process. Another step will be actually drafting legislation to make this move forward. Now, legislation always sounds like a good idea. A lawsuit sounds like a good idea, but the uh, the idea is to get this fixed quickly. It takes Congress a long time to pass a bill. And so the goal is to make, make something happen immediately. So that is why we're really looking to capture your stories so we can give them. The other really important element of this is the media will put pressure on the administration. So we have been working with several, several media outlets and talking with them about the problem You've probably seen there's a lot of different uh, stories right now about Medicare Advantage. And I was looking at one recently where United Healthcare has been um, identified as using uh, algorithms, AI algorithms, uh, instead of clinician care to make some of their clinical decisions. And those are the kind of things that put pressure on Congress and put pressure on CMS to do a better job. So. Uh, we are collecting stories now, we're reaching out to the Congress, we're reaching out to the media, uh, and we want to fix this both short-term and a long-term solution. So stay tuned for more action. I do urge you to take a moment and um, take, tell us your story on NIV because we really need them. We've had a hard time identifying pe people living with ALS, and if your physician is willing to talk with us, um, please let us know. The media are looking for physicians who might go on the record and talk about this, but they'd also like some good background. So you, if you or your physician is experiencing this, please let us know. I also urge you to take action on um, the uh, ALS clinic bill, ABC clinic bill, because uh, the timing is right right now. The bills are introduced and we want to really get as many sponsors uh, for those two bills as we can. I'm happy to uh, take a couple of questions um, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you do uh, in terms of helping with this advocacy effort and helping us to get funding for ALS research and many, many other things. Uh, Kathleen, I'd like to just add a couple of comments. Uh, uh, I totally agree that some Medicare Advantage plans are taking cynical interpretation of the rules and bending them to their own benefit. And that's a tough policing process. But the bigger global problem is severely outdated Medicare coverage policies. And Medicare takes pride in, in uh, basing their coverage criteria on the current science. The current science has moved on and left their policies in the dust. Uh, now, to completely correct that requires a new national coverage determination. That's a very formal process that has a budget and a whole 300 steps involved and a, and a formal um, evaluation of the current science and the current evidence and uh, uh, committees and processes. 
But that is the way that Medicare updates their policies when they recognize that they're out of date or when something new has come along that isn't covered yet. So to make move the, the uh, needle in a major way uh, would be to advocate for a national coverage determination specifically for neuromuscular disease. I'd rather see neuromuscular disease than ALS because you know, there's a lot of kids grown up to adults with uh, congenital uh, neuromuscular diseases who should be served as well. I'd love to see a national coverage determination, and that's a Congress thing. I believe that it requires a, a Congress to make that happen, either in advocacy or through 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 a law. Uh, well, let me say, John, I agree with you 100%. And so we're with you all the way. If we need to have a national coverage determination made. Uh, because you can't rely on uh, informal policies and procedures. It needs to be written down clearly on paper so that everyone understands it and so it can be enforced. Yeah, so there, the, there it isn't so much who is hurt by the current policy. It's are the policies out of date? And now we have European consensus statement and a U.S. consensus statement very seriously adjusted by, by the professional community saying yes. So, you know, you can't just sweep that under the rug. I want to point out something else. Uh, Indu Nuvar is very wonderfully enjoying this um, session. Hello, John. Oh, it's great to see you again. And once before, with the support of somebody else who's on this uh, this call today, uh, on short notice, uh, she put out a, a, a petition. You got 700, 700 signees uh, in uh, pressing um, uh, NIH. Uh, to make important modifications in their prioritization uh, policy for 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 the next ten years, and and NIH actually responded and and pretty much uh, fell into line with what was asked for. So she has this uh, extraordinary magic wand that can put seven hundred signatures on on a on a short petition. So uh, I, Kathleen, if if you thought it was useful. It, then maybe uh, ALS Association could come, could draft. Oh, absolutely. Yes. The and, answer uh, is yes, John. Then, absolutely. Uh, who knows how to get this out to a large number yeah. of ALS in a way that uh, solicits their signatures, the practical things about making that happen. And, you know, you get 500, 700, 800 uh, signatures. You'd have yeah. to decide who this is directed to, who's the receiving end. But it's all, yeah, that's a, it's hard to, it's hard to sweep that under them. Yes, we we used a um, petition before. It was very successful. I think we got like 10,000 uh, signers uh, and presented to CMS when we were trying to get um, Relibrio approved. So it, it is an effective tool. Um, so we that's it's one tool to use. There are many tools and we just got to use all of them. Right. And I think, uh, um, thank you, John. And um, I think it's all about people, you know, citizen driven. That's what we say. And all the people who have joined here today, and they do have some questions for you in Q&A. So um, Brian and Casey are student ambassador, student fellows who are going to kick this the next portion with the Q&A. Um, Casey and Brian, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, John and Kathleen for the phenomenal presentation. To begin the Q&A, our first question is from Benjamin Brooks. Do we need to develop guidelines or go to the courts with a class action suit? Uh, fortunately, the guidelines are written. That's the uh, consensus statement that I, I showed in one of my slides and I gave the technical uh, way to discover that. You can um, access it uh, online. So the, the uh, a, a very good approximation of guidelines is already written by the professional community that can be put forward. And I'll defer to others on whether um, the class action lawsuit would be effective. I thought about it before. I have two patients who might be willing to uh, participate, although they're not Medicare Advantage patients. So we've already begun some discussions along those lines. Um, and the Center for Medicare Advocacy has, has really been great into handling those kinds of matters. So there, I would say there's some discussions underway. It's a lot of research. You, you can't just go into a, a lawsuit until you've done all of your research. So I would say that's certainly one thing that's being considered. Um, if we can get Congress to move quickly, 
or, or CMS, Medicare, who was supposed to get that, of course, would be you know, their short-term solutions and then the long-term solution that, that we've been talking about in terms of a national coverage determination. Lawsuits take a long time, so we'd like to get it done quicker. The second question doesn't have a name to it, but if it was your question, please feel free to unmute. Um, it's, is there any difference in denials between active and passive circuits? Don, I don't know what that means. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, hey, I, I can, I can answer that question. So just to say that, uh, um, one of the dermal medical equipment companies that I'm aware of, uh, routinely automatically uses this more, this heavier, more elaborate um, active circuit as a way of getting around this notion that you can't use a ventilator for anything that could be done by a bi-level device. So I know of one company, that's their wraparound. Uh, we don't generally use active circuits. All you need to know is that it's a a different set of tubing that's often heavier and it weighs more heavily on your face or on a tracheostomy and it's not necessary. Uh, so we don't use that wraparound solution, but I know that one company that does and they they break through by, by taking that strategy. I can speak to that from a supplier standpoint, if you can hear me. Um, we do not use active circuits at all and have never had any difference in... Um, authorizations based on the circuit type. It's more about the device itself and the mode being used. Thank you, Chris. Perfect. Next question, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but it's from Sparrow. Next question is, why is there not a class action suit? I think I've just addressed that. We have to do the research uh, to make, to get a successful suit going. Uh, and we have to have a, a law firm that's willing to carry the ball. So we're, we're looking into that. Jack has asked if you could please list the good versus poor Medicare Advantage plans. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I, I, you know, I retired. I have a merit issue. You can't take my uh, faculty appointment away. You can't take my salary away. What are you going to do to me? So I'm a little more courageous than some people might be, but I'm just going to put uh, put a target on uh, Aetna and U.S. Healthcare. Uh, they infuriate us, those two big companies. I have to say, we've heard a lot of complaints about United and Humana. May I ask and, the... And uh, the United co complaints are across the entire patient advocacy community. I, I haven't asked other patient advocacy groups, uh, and they also, United does a lot of, of marketing. Now, again, I'm talking United Medicare Advantage. If you get your supplemental plan from ARP for United, you're probably fine. Doesn't make any difference to you what it does. So I'm talking United Medicare Advantage. And don't maybe tell anybody, say, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so maybe you say, I'm going to stay away from those companies, but frankly, I'd rather, if you already have them, uh, uh, put up your dukes and fight uh, on behalf of the community rather. They want you to switch away, right? You're, you're a loser. You're not going to make any money off of ALS, so they would love it if you switch away from those companies. I didn't know. Yeah, Sean, sure, but I would encourage people if they're unhappy to look at to call their state health insurance program and 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 have a discussion about what other options might be. Did you have questions, Sally? I did. I didn't know how to go through Brian and Casey, but my husband has ALS and he's using the ventilator right now. And he wanted me to ask, uh, he has Medicare Advantage right now, A and B, but what does he need for supplements to get on just Medicare to cover his second ventilator? We're, we're in that spot where he needs two, but it keeps being denied for the second one, even though his pulmonologists and neurologists have talked directly with trying to get that done. So he's, his question is, if he goes to Medicare, not Advantage, what 
supplement does he need after A and B in order to get the coverage he has with the advantage? To my knowledge, the supplemental insurers have no excuse not to do the the. I took the wording exactly out of out of the policy, uh, so there. Uh, the strongest case. The strongest case. Is more than X hours a day of ventilator use. Now, is that ten hours? Is it sixteen hours? More than X hours of use and a willingness and ability to get out of bed and move around. It's even stronger if somebody uses mouthpiece ventilation because the circuitry and the settings are so very different between the two. So if he's up in the 14, 16 hour range and or uh, using a mouthpiece ventilation, he is very much in the spirit of the current Medicare policy. And if he has a... Um, uh, uh, supplement plan, they're just flat out uh, out of line uh, with current policy. And you you can access that policy. If you, if you look up um, CMS or Medicare policy uh, ventilators, it's techno language, but you scroll down and you'll find these exact words that you can use in, in fighting with them. Also, if I may add to that, I work for one of the suppliers, the the patients that do not have a power wheelchair for the second ventilator get denied. Um, doctor, you're right about the utilization of, of those of those hours, but that's one thing that we've been noticing as well. Yeah, the, the rule is, the second part of the rule that I didn't show is very substantially different uh, setup between night and day. That's the concept. Somebody in the chat said that they use the same machine and the same settings day and night. That sometimes works. It works really well for you. You don't need a second ventilator. You can just switch them back and forth. If you're okay with it, you're okay with it. Um, but people come to us... Uh, using the same settings day and night. We change the day settings and they're a lot happier and they go a lot longer before they feel like they can't breathe anymore. So uh, sometimes the same settings and, and setup works and sometimes you're better served with different settings during the day. Perfect, next question is we have is from Jose. I'm in Illinois and it was a breeze getting a ventilator. But DME said it was a forever rental until I pass or cover. The question is, this participant is planning on moving overseas. Would they have any problems or any difficulties obtaining obtaining a ventilator? <laughs> yeah. uh, we've done that a couple of times. A couple of our patients have moved overseas. Uh, in one instance, uh, a big DME company we had had contacts in the other country and were able to make a make a referral, cross referral in that other country. Uh, so, um, de fully developed countries, Europe, Japan, um, have less hassle and less resistance to support in life than than we do, and and, and there's fairly straightforward uh, uh, support. So, if a person moving abroad. Uh, can go on the insurance of that other country. It's just a matter of paperwork. Felix Sauer, and, and with the, he'd been in a previous relationship. He was upset because apparently there was a breakup uh, that was occurring. And he oh, was so well. Okay. Um, Next question is from Dave, and he actually has two questions. So the first one is, is there opportunity or synergy to advocating for a more fulsome patient bill of rights inclusive of proper home NIV? And then the second one is, Anna routinely denies Relivrio. Why not go after medication denial issues too? Yeah, we are going after medication issues. The ALS Association has regular discussions with um, um, Alex about who's denying, why they're denying, and we've written quite a few letters to complain about this. Um, and what, what, again, what they say is 
you know, Aetna may have a Medicare Advantage plan that denies, but their Medicare fee-for-service doesn't deny. So it, these are some of the complexities. So um, I certainly follow up with me afterwards. Um, uh, there, I did put our email address on the bottom of the slides, um, and we can certainly look into it. But we, we wrote a letter today, I believe, to CBS about uh, their coverage of Relivrio. We've been knocking... Uh, Cigna, we've had phone calls with them, letters, um, contacted CMS. So we we are out of these, yes, we're out of it. And we the, the bottom line is that we need to fix Medicare Advantage so it doesn't make it so darn hard for people to get what they need. And and Medicare, any other any glitches with traditional Medicare, uh, we need to fix as well. I'm just going to mention a grand solution. It's by this guy. Uh, similar issues drove a number of years ago to a special carve out for chronic renal failure. Now, if you get chronic kidney failure requiring dialysis, you automatically switch into Medicare into a comprehensive coverage program that deals with all aspects of, uh, of ma health maintenance for people on dialysis on into transplant. Uh, it's been, you know, rocky in the detail level, but very successful overall. Well, folks, uh, I'm not sure they see a big difference between a kidney uh, dialysis machine and a ventilator. Uh, they're both life support machines. And if it's about uh, people who are so highly dependent on life support, an analogy can be made very directly. I'd love to see for... Uh, neuromuscular disease patients uh, dependent on mechanical ventilation longer than X hours a day, longer than eight or 10 hours a day, automatically switch into a specialized coverage that uh, deals with all aspects of, of supportive care into, into speech and into uh, mobility and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work and effort to construct such a thing it's a modest number of people, uh, but that would be the grand solution that that uh, would be so helpful to so many people and bring us up to speed with the with the best of the European countries in coverage. Uh, I agree, John. Grand solution is definitely needed, but for the moment, we need to just plug away at the uh, immediate problems that we can identify and solve. Congress right now can't even decide on a federal budget. So, um, and we're honestly, we're quite worried also about ALS appropriations for research. These, these um, stopgap measures basically mean that uh, NIH has to put the brakes on some of the things that they're doing or they want to do. Doesn't hurt current clinical trials, but it certainly hurts new clinical trials. So um, there's also an action alert on our website uh, asking Congress to uh, provide more and more funding for uh, for ALS research. We we really need it. We're underfunded, uh, and and it's time to get it going. And I don't know what's going to happen in the house. So um, we have to pray and work like hell. And as Don said, get mad. Thank you guys so very much. And um, McFan, if you wouldn't mind ending this presentation and Q&A by thanking our speakers and telling uh, Can I just interrupt uh, very quickly, Kathleen, I hope you saw a message in the um, in the chat uh, suggesting that we contact Judy Stein. Uh, yeah, I'm already in discussions for sure. No I'm doubt. already talking to CMA. We, we're all, we're all yeah, John. We, we, we called them a there while back. And then I'll uh, point out the uh, message. We're filming a PBS documentary next month on assistive technology for ALS. And uh, uh, I'd love to see uh, this issue included in that documentary. Well, thank you, John. You were here many years ago and uh, you're, you're, you're looking bright and shiny. So thank you for have balancing out your life with your purpose. And uh, we cannot say enough, Kathleen, John, these are the moments that are making a difference in the people who are on, who are looking at you tonight. You are talking to people who have a mission 
and their mission is to help you to help them. So this is citizen-driven research, folks. We're all in this together. There's no sitting on the sidelines unless you want to. That's perfectly okay. Because we know when you can help, you will. And so with that, thank you again. And folks, it's time to open it up to what you have on your mind this evening. Thank you.